Welcome to worship. I'm thinking, whoo. Excuse me, where are you going? What you got? You want to do announcements with me? Yeah. Here. All right. So, good morning. Welcome to worship. Let me Let's fly down. Woo. Here. All yours. Lord God, this is a day that you've given us as a gift. Let every day that we stand here before you be a day that we know is worthy of your worship. So now we calm our hearts and we let the spirit well up in us so that we can passionately worship you today. Thank you, Lord. And we look forward to the way your spirit will move in and through us so your word is proclaimed. This is the truth we claim in Jesus Christ, the author of salvation, the King of kings, and our personal Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, this word that you give us as a gift is a word that means more to us than perhaps we even acknowledge. So we ask today in this time as we settle our hearts and, and listen to you speak to us through this, your holy word, that we hear it for what it is, as a gift from you, a gift to train us and prepare us so that we may be proven worthy of sharing it authentically with others. We ask, Lord, that today you give to us an opportunity to live out all that you have given us, all the knowledge and the many examples of how to live. And we ask that you do that so that we may be you for the world. We claim this gift in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay. Let me find the scripture. Okay. Maybe I'm not going to find the scripture. We just happen to have a Bible over here. Matthew, Mark, okay. All right. Man, I can read this Bible. It's like big letters. This is good. All right, so the Gospel of John 2, 13 to 32. This scripture we're about to share is a little bit controversial, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So hear this, the Word of God. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And in the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers at their business. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all with the sheep and oxen out of the temple. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. You shall not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for thy house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign have you to show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus has spoken. I'm going to stop there at 23. So the reason this is controversial, we think of Jesus as a prince of peace, right? I mean, we want to look at Jesus as, as love and as kind and as compassion and healing, and certainly that's who Jesus is. So why all the anger? What's up with running around, turning over tables, and making a whip? It sounds kind of violent. Assertive. Thank you, Lindy. Thank you. I should have used that word. I will now. Assertive Jesus. You know, I've used this scripture to justify my assertiveness before. Not always appropriately. But there was a reason Jesus was so angry. You have to understand the context of this passage. They're going to worship. Just like you came to church this morning to worship. 
And they go in, and there's all these rules. The church, some of them imposed by the Romans, some of them imposed by the, the church itself, the temple authority. There were rules. You have to have certain kind of pigeons. No blemishes. But if you bought your pigeon inside the temple from the sellers, you got a break. It didn't have to be perfectly clean. That doesn't sound right, but that was one of the rules. Oh, no, but if you buy it from us, you come inside, then it can have a blemish or two. It's okay because you bought it in the temple. And why money changers, right? I mean, they're in Jerusalem. Well, what did Roman coins have on the face? We had a picture of that last year. Caesar. You can't worship Caesar, so they cannot bring Roman money into the temple. Well, you know them temple priests wanted their offering, right? So money changers, in exchange for having a place inside the temple, would give an offering to the temple priest. And then they would sell temple money. Money specifically for the temple. So you would trade in your Roma money and get temple money so you can now give it to the priest. And what did they do afterwards? They go right back to money changers and trade it back. It was a scam. Jesus knew this. People were taking advantage of the desire for those to worship God. They were taking advantage of them. And Jesus was having none of that in his father's house. And he told them that. But more important than Jesus turning over tables and getting angry and, and letting them know what was going on was why he did it. I mean, sure, we know because they were doing something wrong. But when he did that, that caused people to question him, question his authority. And now Jesus had an opportunity to tell people exactly whose authority he lives by. Now he had an opportunity to give people that authority that knowledge. Oh, I'll tell you. You want to know under what authority I do this? It's my father's house. My father gives me the authority to do this. Who gave you the authority to change money? What in God? It was a greedy priest. Right? I'm paraphrasing, but you know. So the disciples see this and they say, wait a second. If we're following Jesus, his authority is from God. Does that mean that we have the authority of God? Does that mean that we today have the authority of the Almighty God with us? That we can have some authority in the world? Yes. That's what the gift Jesus gives us in this passage. It's not about being angry, turning over tables and making whips. It's about knowing that, you know what? We're not just out there telling people, giving them a lesson that we learned in a book in Sunday school or something in a lecture in church. We have the authority of the Holy Spirit to express to people that there is something out there that offers them eternal life. No one else can do that but Jesus. We have the authority of the Holy Spirit to go into the world and tell people, you know what? Everybody makes mistakes. I've made mistakes. That could be a whole other sermon. But everyone in here has sinned against God in one way or another. But we can come in here, we can do it at home. With Jesus, we have someone who's allowed us a way to turn over our sins, to be completely forgiven. Even when we can't find it in ourselves to forgive ourselves, God loves us enough to forgive us. So we have Jesus who has the authority of God because he is God to forgive our sins and to usher us into eternal life. That's a powerful story. It's powerful. And when we see these Stories in the Bible over and over again. We have things like Jesus turn over tables. We have tax collectors climbing up in trees to see him, right? We have people crawling through the crowd on their hands and knees just to touch the hem of his garments. Over and over, there's story after story after story that tell us this man, Jesus, walking around in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, is not just another man. He has authority. And with that authority comes passion. See, that's the key to modern-day Christianity and evangelism. We can have all the small groups we want. I wish we had more. I've offered to start one for you on Thursday night, and no one's taken me up on that yet. I'm not, not to make you feel guilty, I'm just saying. If you want to be in a small group, you're not, want, not in one, come see me. We'll have it here. I'll lead you through it. We'll get you a small group. 
I wish we had more Sunday schools, although we have many. And the ones we have are wonderful. But you can go out in the world with the knowledge of the Bible and tell people about Jesus, but if you are not passionate about it, if people don't see in you a passion, a love that you have for Jesus, it's probably not going to be effective. I mean, I'll give me an example. All right, I've, I've told you all this. I'm not going to go on this big story. I don't have a lot of time. But I was born 54 years ago. <laughs> and my dad, my mom, they divorced when I was very young, three or four years old. And my mom remarried when I was six. And when I was 12, my stepfather adopted me. So at 12, my name became Clark. Before that, my last name was Holland. Anyone have Hollands in their family? We may be related. Okay. So my biological father is a Buddhist priest. Okay. All right. So, you know, well, I'm not, all my life, I could say getting things from him, and it, that there was not much relationship. But since he became a Buddhist priest, he just loves sending me presents. I have so many books telling me why I need to be Buddhist. I can't. If you're interested, I'll show you a couple of them. But I actually got to spend some time with him, and he did say something. And this is what I realized. Just like Jesus had this authority, he knew that what was going on wasn't right. Bill Holland, my biological father, this Buddhist priest, gave me this, uh, this thing, some Japanese letters on it. We opened it up, and it's, it's supposed to be like his mantra, I guess. When you're Buddhist priest, they give you this mantra. And it's, every day is a good day. Thinking, you know, that's, that'll preach. And the way he explained it, I said, that sounds like Jesus. So, and that's what I told him. I said, you know, that's good. I'm glad your, you know, sensei, whoever it is, your priest, Dharma, has told you this wonderful thing. But you, went, you grew up Episcopal. I bet you heard that in the gospel time after time, right? And that's what I told him. We talked about that. But that's true. Every day is a good day. Even days that you walk into a group of people and you just feel like making a whip out of cords. Every day that you know that your eternity is guaranteed by the blood of Jesus Christ, how could that day get any better? Hallelujah. Isn't that a truth we want everyone to know? That no matter how bad things are, if you have the passion of a follower of Christ, and you know and you believe in your heart that you're saved, and you know Jesus loves you, and it's okay that you have a bad day. If you know that eternally you have the hope of perfection, perfect love, perfect health, I'm hoping a perfect waistline. I'm just saying, you know, that's right, it's not going to matter. Well, perfect bodies, maybe this is my perfect body. Okay. So, let's just let's think about that as we go in this time of communion. What a story we have to tell. And yeah, I've felt like turning some tables over time and again. And perhaps I have. Perhaps you have. But, I mean, I hope I'm not doing it out of some false sense of authority. I hope that I always present myself and, and try to lead when I'm called out of passionate authority, out of the authority I have from the Holy Spirit. The same authority, no more, no less, than you have as a follower of Jesus. So as people of passionate authority, let's celebrate our Lord Jesus in Holy Communion. Put this back on the Psalms real quick. I use this Bible more often. When we celebrate this meal together, it's good that we remember, because that's what he tells us to do, that everything that Christ was about to do from this meal forward, he did for us. We know it wasn't on his top ten list of things to do because he spent some time in the garden praying about it, right? You know, sometimes God calls us to do things that are very important that we don't want to do. Why? Because doing it 
brings others into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So he met with his disciples. And he took this bread that they were about to eat that reminded them of how they were saved from slavery and led to freedom through the desert. And he took the bread, he gave thanks, broke the bread, shared it with everyone and said, take and eat, for this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. Before, this bread represented manna from heaven, a gift from God that sustained people on a 40-year journey to their salvation, to their freedom. But Jesus says, no, this is my body. You, I am your manna. I am what leads you to eternal life. Then he took the cup, he raised it, gave thanks to God, shared it with everyone present. This cup is my blood, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This represents a new covenant for you and for everyone. This is the body and the blood of Christ broken for you and shed for you. Lord God, pour out your Holy Spirit on all that are gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ so we may be for the world the body of Christ telling a life-saving story. May all hear it and may all know that in you they have life and life eternal. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. I invite the servers to come forward and any musicians that need to come up. And I need you to know that uh, you need not be a member of this church or United Methodist. The only requirement for you to come up and take the, receive this bread with open hands, you'll be given the bread by the servers, dip it in the cup, and know that represents the body and blood of Christ. That's it. Everyone is welcome because God came and died so everyone may know the love of Christ. You know, my brother, this is the body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Michael, the body and blood of our Lord and Savior gift of life. Love of the body of Christ, the bread of heaven, the blood of salvation. Tina, this is the body of Christ and the blood of our Lord broken and shed for you. Thanks be to God. The table is ready. The meal is prepared. The ushers will lead you down. Spend as much time at the rail as you like. This is the body and blood of Christ, the gift of life given for you. Lord Jesus, this gift is more than just nourishment of our body. It's a reminder that you are all we need to get through our todays and our tomorrows. May we always remember that it is because you loved us that you did this for us. May we continue to model that love to others so all may know that you are God, that you are the Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We praise you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Keep your hands up. Join with your neighbor. Receive this benediction. Lord, our soul cries out, and we ask you to prepare the world to hear. To hear that you are our Lord. And we go from this place now with a passionate authority, knowing that you go with us. And it's in that strength that we share the peace of Christ with all. When we can end today... We will share the peace of Christ with one another as we leave this place, knowing that you are our God and our Lord. Go in peace. Amen.